Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's your girl, the Brooke Ashley, and today we are here to discuss The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, season three, reunion part one. And before we get started, let me just say this first part was just okay. I was getting tired of Lisa interrupting every few minutes. Lisa, not every segment is about you. And while I enjoy imitating your voices, I just said, girl, please be quiet. Heather was on BS. When they got to her eye, I said, girl, you are playing in everybody's faces. Whitney still can't own up to anything that she's said or done. And then you have have both of the Angies just desperate and thirsty. And I forgot that Dana was even there. But with all that being said, let's just jump right on into it because you guys already know that we don't have a minute to spare. Now, let me just start off by saying that the ladies look great. Definitely their best reunion looks to date. I loved Heather's look, the soft glam, the hair, the dress, one of her best. I said, Heather, you need to always keep this look. Like she looked good. I thought Meredith looked great. I loved her dress. The color was perfect. The hair, flawless. I thought Lisa looked pretty as well. Whitney's dress, I didn't love it, but I thought that she looked really pretty. I liked her hair. The makeup was on point but definitely an improvement from their first two reunions. So Andy kicks off the reunion by revealing that Bravo reached out to Jen and they wanted Jen to be at the reunion, but Jen's legal team advised against it. Now let's be real. I, along with other people, did not believe for a minute that Jen would actually show up especially since she pled guilty. Of course, Andy's asking all the ladies how they feel about Jen skipping the reunion. Lisa says that she has mixed emotions about the whole thing because she wanted to get some closure. Then you have Heather saying that Jen was a huge part of the season, so it feels like a big void. And now you have Andy bringing up the guilty plea and he wants to know how they feel about it. Whitney says that she was surprised because Jen went the whole entire season for claiming her innocence. So here goes Lisa saying, I have mixed emotions about this whole thing, but ultimately Jen did what she had to do. Meredith says that she was shocked as well. And then Heather says that Jen called her ahead of time to let her know, and they cried on the phone together. Now, if I'm being honest, I feel like they're all full of it. I don't believe for one minute that any of these women thought that Jen was innocent. I don't. And a quick side note, is it just me or does it feel like Heather is always trying to one up the group by acting like I'm just so close to Jen. Like nobody here on this stage is as close to Jen as I am. That's the impression that I get her casually dropping it in there that Jen called her up prior and let her know. I just said, okay, Heather, we get it. You're Jen's best friend. When Andy asked Heather how she felt about Jen changing her plea from innocent to guilty, and she said, the only thing I felt was sadness for her family. I said, okay, Heather. I feel like Heather always being so syrupy sweet, it reads as very phony and disingenuous. It's okay if you do feel like Jen lied to you and you're upset about it. That's a normal feeling. Anybody would feel that way. You have your friend claiming that she's innocent when she knows that she was actually out here scamming, and then it comes out that she's guilty and she did it, I would feel upset too. So it's okay if you're upset about it. Now, when we get to the Lisa versus Meredith segment, I have to say it really showed me how delusional and hypocritical Lisa is. Because the fact that Lisa feels like she can say whatever she wants, but then when Meredith claps back and shades her, it's a problem. I'm like, Lisa, you can't have it both ways. I cannot stand the way Lisa Lisa wants to act like this victim all the time. And it seems like she's a hard time acknowledging when she's wrong. But Andy wants to know, despite them not being friends anymore, are they on speaking terms? So Meredith gives a really shady answer and she turns to Lisa and she's like, well, I wished you a happy birthday. And Lisa says, thank you, happy birthday to you too. So now Andy's like, wait, 
when did you wish Lisa a happy birthday? Because if I recall, you only said it on Watch What Happens Live with me a few months ago. And she's like, yeah, that's when I said it. So now Andy's like, well, did you wish her a happy birthday face to face? And Meredith says, no, I said the shade of it all. So now Andy wants to know from Meredith if Lisa had reached out to her and wanted to have a sit down conversation about the hot mic moment, would Meredith have been open to it? And would she have sat down and talked to Lisa? Meredith says that she would have been open to having a conversation. And Lisa says that she did not get those vibes from Meredith. Now, I think that Lisa's full of it. I feel like when you have severely betrayed or wronged one of your closest friends, you owe it to yourself and to them to reach out to them. And it might take a few tries. Meredith had every right to be angry at Lisa because Lisa said some really vile things about her and her family. So who wouldn't be upset? I have always felt like regarding this hot mic situation, Lisa wants to make herself out to be the victim. She's angry that Meredith is mad at her when it's like, but sis, that's not how this works. You did something wrong. Your friend no longer wants to be bothered with you and now you're upset at her reaction? You had no right to say those things on national TV about your friend. You can't police Meredith's feelings on that. Like, how dare you? Now, Meredith makes it clear that she's not still angry about the hot mic moment. She's angry about other stuff that Lisa's done. So Meredith reveals that her and Lisa were in a neutral space when they were in Arizona together. And then when they came back from the trip, she noticed that Lisa removed her from her follower list on Instagram and that she blocked her from her stories. And then she says that what sent her over the edge was at last year's reunion, she expressed how hurt she was after her dad passed away and Lisa did not reach out to her. So to make things worse, Lisa was on Twitter posting these text messages of her reaching out to Meredith, but Meredith points out that it was a month after her father passed away and Lisa was trying to spin it like, I am a good friend, I was there for Meredith, but she wasn't showing that it was from a month later. So she says that once again, Lisa was trying to lie and spin the narrative like she's the victim when that wasn't the case. Lisa, you really have to grow up. Stop posting all these personal text messages on your Twitter account. You look crazy doing that at your big age. And also sis, I understand that you and Meredith weren't talking at the time, but when her father passed away, that makes no sense that you didn't reach out to her. Like I couldn't imagine. And Meredith, if I were you, I would have never spoken to Lisa again for that. That's an automatic block. Like, are you serious right now? Even if we're not on the best of terms, the decent thing to do is to reach out. Like I just don't understand Lisa's logic. Andy reads some viewer questions asking Meredith, if her plan all along was to get revenge on Lisa about the hot mic moment, because it seemed like all season long, she was talking crap about Lisa. So Meredith says that the context of the conversations were cut out and she was saying this out of worry and concern for Lisa because she felt like Lisa's behavior was becoming really weird and erratic. So she says that she probably should have reached out to Lisa, but she didn't. I like Meredith a lot, but sis, I want you to be honest. Just say that you wanted revenge. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Your former best friend embarrassed you on national TV, saying some really disgusting things about you and your family. I know you were holding a grudge and you wanted revenge this season. It's okay, just own it. But I'm not buying this story that you were concerned about her behavior. You were just mad. <laughs> <laughs> but Meredith goes on to apologize to Lisa. She says, regardless of my intentions, Lisa, I apologize for saying what I said. Now here's where I really got annoyed because when Andy read the viewer question regarding the rumors about Lisa giving BJ's for jazz tickets and her giving sexual favors for a Vita tequila placement. So Whitney interjects and she says, for the record, I never said that Meredith started the rumors. I just said that she brought the rumors up first. That's what I said. And I said, no, Whitney, let's play the tapes back. Because when you guys were in Arizona and you brought all the mess, 
you lied on Meredith and said that she started the rumors. Did you not? I was just so irritated with Whitney. I said, girl, shut up. You lie all the time. Never own up to what you say about people. You always put some extra sauce on a damn story. And then you get upset when you're called out. And then you talk in that baby voice like we're dumb. So now Whitney adds that she's not the one who said the rumor about the BJs for courtside jazz tickets. That was Angie Harrington. And then she adds that when they got to Arizona, Heather spun her words. And I said, what planet is Whitney living on? Whitney always deflects and just flat out lies. She's always spinning the story. I was like, Whitney, please shut up. Because Heather told you repeatedly when you guys were in Arizona to keep your mouth shut, just have a good time, let everybody enjoy themselves because this trip is supposed to be about healing and about making sure that Jen feels good before she goes off to prison. It's not about you and any of this drama, but you couldn't help yourself and you ran right on over to Lisa at that dinner and you started this whole entire thing. So the audacity of you to say that, well, Meredith started all of this and Heather spun my words, I was like, really? Are we watching the same show? Like Whitney, what's wrong with you? And even Heather and Meredith were so annoyed. They were like, really, how do we start this? And one thing about Lisa, Lisa loves the fact that Whitney is desperate to be her friend. And she loves a good yes man because she was there applauding Whitney. She was like, Whitney got a lot of hate from a lot of people in this group, but she did the right thing. She stopped all the lies. And honestly speaking, Whitney would have nothing to bring up had other ladies in this group not been talking about me to her. I was so irritated. I was like, okay, Lisa, because first and second season, you couldn't stand Whitney. Now all of a sudden, she's your new BFF and you just love her, and you're just so happy that she defends you now. It's like, it's such a joke. And one thing I've noticed about Lisa, Lisa wants people to jump to her defense, but when it comes to defending other people, she doesn't want to do that. She wants to play neutral, straddle the fence. I can't stand people like that. Because I didn't forget how she was playing both sides of the fence when Meredith and Jen were going at it last season. Like, girl, what? Meredith is your good friend of 10 years and you can't have her back? Like, let's make it make sense. It's so annoying. I was so happy that Meredith was not gonna play this game. She said, look, I wouldn't have said anything either but Whitney was running her mouth about you and she disclosed a lot of your tea. And I said, come through Meredith, cause we all know that Whitney is a big gossip. We've seen time and time again, where Whitney will gossip about one of the ladies and then she'll go back and tell what they said about that person and won't say what she said. Lisa really irritated me when Andy brought up her accusations of Meredith having a pill problem when they were in San Diego. And Lisa said, well, it's not about that. I brought that up because Jen told me that she and Meredith were doing ketamine and I think something else. So that's why I said it. And Meredith, if you want, you can call Jen and ask her because that's what she told me. And when Meredith said, that's a very bitchy thing to say about somebody, and then here goes Lisa. Well, we all say bitchy things. It's like, girl, can you not deflect? Just own up to what you said. You wanna sit up here and cry and scream and you're demanding apologies over the accusations about sexual favors and BJ's for courtside tickets, but now you can't acknowledge when you've hurt somebody with what you've said? Like, it really gets me so annoyed how Lisa does this all the time. Lisa is always the victim. And her favorite go-to line is, well, we all say that. We all deflect. We all get mad. We all say bitchy things when we're angry. Like, no, girl. What you said was wrong. And you'd be the first one crying and screaming if somebody accused you or John of having a pill problem, right? Lisa feels like the rules apply to everybody but her. She can say and do what she wants, but everybody else has to watch their mouths when it comes to her. And I'm sorry, sis, but that's not how this works. So Meredith is like, okay, since you claim that Jen told you this, I'm gonna call her up right now and see who's telling the truth. 
So here goes Lisa. I have no reason to lie. You should hear the other stuff that she's saying about you around town. I know who I am. I know my character. And she's the one going to jail, not me. And I said, well, damn. Tell us how you really feel then. And also, Lisa, if you were smart, you would realize that you just contradicted yourself. Because for you to say, well, she's going to jail, so don't believe her, but yet you believe Jen's accusations about Meredith having a pill problem, which one is it? So Jen picks up the phone, she denies it. You have Lisa screaming in the background. You told me that it was ketamine and shrooms. So Meredith says, oh, I was doing shrooms now, really? <laughs> So once again, Jen denies it and she says, yeah, I never said that. So here goes Lisa. Well, I don't expect you to tell the truth now because you never tell the truth. So bye. And again, she's going to jail, not me. And I said, oh, okay. And my point remains, you only believe Jen when it's something bad about Meredith. But when it's something bad about you, now she's lying and she's a jailbird. Got it. Andy brings up Meredith and her comments about Lisa and the SEC filing. Her and Lisa go back and forth about that. And then Meredith says, look, at the end of the day, our friendship is non-existent. It is broken beyond repair. It's very sad. And we've both said some very hateful things about each other. Like we're both at fault. But hopefully we can get to a cordial place where we treat each other with kindness and respect. I like how Meredith is able to acknowledge that she's not all the way innocent either. That she's been spiteful and upset. Now my opinion, I feel like Meredith is justified and what she said, because listen, I'm gonna go all the way off too. If one of my good friends gets on national TV bashing me the way Lisa did in that bathroom, I would be going off too. I would definitely be out there seeking revenge. And y'all know me, we've talked about this at length, all right? Like I am not a forgiving person. So I would be giving it to Lisa again and again and again. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my no. God. <laughs> and you're going to always get it again and again and again. So here goes Lisa with the waterworks. It's been really, really devastating for me because I just never thought that me and Meredith, my best friend of 10 years, would ever be in this position. And nobody knows that it was very, very, very sad for me to deal with this. And then on top of that, it's like, you bring John into this? Like, stop fixating on me. And I wanted to ask, Lisa, are you on drugs? You do remember that in that hot mic moment, you brought up Seth and her children. You were talking about Seth can't keep a job. They're always moving around from house to house. Do they even have any money? and their kids are doing those dumb poses. Like, sis, are we doing this for real? You're mad that she brought up your husband, but you brought up hers first. And you talked about her kids. Like, I just don't get it. Lisa, you have got to stop acting like you are the victim. Own up to something. My God, it's tiring. So now we change gears and all of the friends of the show join the rest of the ladies. So you have Angie Kay on the couch, Dana, and Angie Harrington. And when I tell you that all three of them looked like they had died and gone to heaven, okay? They felt like they were at the Super Bowl, the Olympics. They were just so happy. I mean, it radiated from their pores that they were so happy to be on that reunion couch with Andy Cohen. <laughs> So Andy reads a viewer question directed at Dana. And the question reads, did Dana plan on getting along with Jen Shaw? Because it seems like she was hell bent on giving Jen a hard time. So Dana says that in the beginning, when she met Jen for the first time at that ski day, things were good between them. They had a great time. Jen seemed cool. But then she said that things turned at Heather's choir auditions when Jen got really nasty and was yelling at Angie Harrington. And she said that that really triggered her. Now, while that might be so, 
there's always a part of me that feels like a lot of these newbies want to make their mark and a way to stay on the show is by gunning for the OG. Then Andy reads another question. The question is, why did Dana let everybody know that she was friends with an informant? So she says that she brought that up at the dinner because she was hoping that Jen would open up about it and be honest. Now I said, Jen has yet to open up to anybody about her scams. So why do you think that she would talk about it with you and actually tell the truth? Like, let's use our heads here, Dana. And then they bring up why Dana blew up at Jen at Heather's book party. Of course, they finally air the unseen footage that they had been teasing all season long where Dana says, girl, you better stop before I don't put any money on your books. And it's like, okay, don't show us this now. I would have loved to have seen that scene in the finale episode. But anyhow, Dana says that she blew up that night because she was sick and tired of Jen being really nasty to her. We learn that Jen was making fun of where Dana lives and she was also making fun of her husband's name. So she's like, who does that? Then she adds that she could buy Jen's rental five times over. So the fact that Jen of all people wants to make fun of where she lives, like what a joke. The audacity and the gall for Jen Shaw of all people, the queen of fake purses, bags, borrowed furs, borrowed Porsches, rented chalets. She's talking about somebody and where they live. I wish somebody with some fake Cartier, fake Van Cleef, fake Birkins would ever come at me about anything. So now we get off of Dana and now we're here to talk about Miss Angie Harrington and did she or did she not start the rumor about Lisa Barlow giving BJ's for courtside jazz tickets? So Angie Harrington says no, but she does acknowledge that her and Whitney were on the phone one day and they were discussing some rumors. So Angie Harrington goes on to say that her husband Chris was courtside at a jazz game when Lisa's husband John rolled up on him and was acting crazy. So Lisa says, don't talk about my husband. No, he wasn't. He just said to Chris to stay away from him. That's what he said. So Angie Harrington says, no, John was acting crazy, very erratic. He was cursing, your son was there. And it got so bad that security came to get your husband. Now, you know, Lisa gets so upset the minute you talk about her husband. So she's like, again, don't talk about my husband's character. Everybody knows about your husband's character. So Angie Harrington continues on by saying that she called up Whitney and gave her the tea about John Barlow's erratic behavior. And Angie points out that John was sitting in this particular person's seat. I think it's the person who they're accusing Lisa of blowing for the tickets. But anyhow, Angie Harrington claims that Whitney asked if there's something going on between Lisa and that person. And Angie says that all she said was that the thought crossed her mind as well. Now, I believe that Angie Harrington and Whitney are both messy. I wouldn't be surprised if either one of them made a comment about, yeah, you think that she's blowing this guy so that John could sit courtside? Like, I don't know. I just, I'm not buying either one of their stories, to be honest. I think that Angie Harrington and Whitney are both full of it. And now that the secret is out, they're both trying to place blame on each other because you have Whitney now trying to throw Angie Harrington under the bus. And she says, well, me and Angie Harrington used to have conversations all the time and I would give her a pass because she always seems to forget stuff. Whitney has the gift of sidestepping the question and getting out of repeating what she said. And Angie Harrington, I have to call you out because in one breath you're saying, well, I don't believe that she would ever do that for tickets. Then in the next breath is, well, the thought did cross my mind when I was talking to Whitney on the phone about this. Like, make up your mind. Angie Harrington is always talking out two sides of her face all the time. Now you have Andy reading a question to Meredith asking Meredith, she seems to have all the tea about 
Lisa and the SEC filings, along with Lisa allegedly having troll accounts to troll her cast members. Lisa's denying it. She's like, I have never made a fake Instagram account in my life. I use my own face, okay? Like, I have never trolled anybody. That's a lie. Angie Harrington, your husband is the one trolling people. And the same way Andy was over this conversation, so was I. I said, there's only so many times I can hear about this whole courtside seat fiasco. I don't care anymore. It's tired. Now it's time for the Angie K segment. And if Thirsty was a person, it would be her. I mean, mama was salivating for Andy to ask her those questions. And I loved how Miss Meredith checked her at the end. But anyhow, Andy reads a viewer question asking Angie K about the San Diego trip and why exactly was Jen so angry at Angie K being the co-hostess of the trip. So Angie K says that Jen wanted her to be in this group with conditions. She wanted her to feel like she was below everybody else, not do too much, and pretty much be on a leash. Now, there are people like that where they feel like, okay, I brought you into this circle, but don't do too much, sis. Like, you're my friend, okay? Remember who brought you in here? Me. And they want you to remember that. Definitely giving those vibes of know your place, okay? Like, I'm here, you're there. All the ladies acknowledge that they could feel the vibes the minute they got in that house, and they already knew that Jen was about to show her ass especially when Angie K picked out the best room in the house. So now Andy brings up when Jen poured the champagne on Angie K and Angie K says that Jen did that out of a control thing. She wanted Angie K to know her place. And I agree completely. Jen was definitely checking Angie to let her know like, okay, know your place, all right? Like, again, I'm the leader of this group. I brought you in. Don't do too much. Just sit there and be quiet. That's what that was. I thought it was shady of Heather when she said that she thought the drink toss was funny. Angie Kay's upset. She's like, really, Heather? And then Heather says, look, if you're that upset about what I said, then you're going to have a hard time sitting on this couch. And I was like, oh, okay. Again, Heather is not as nice as she tries to portray. She is low-key a mean girl. This little nice act, I'm this naive Mormon girl, like, it's all an act. Because I don't understand how you found humor in somebody getting a drink poured over them. Heather, we all know how you act. You allow Jen to treat you in whatever raggedy way she wants to, but everybody else doesn't go for that. Then we have Andy reading a viewer question asking, was it below the belt of Angie K to equate Jen not paying for that party to her conning the victims out of hard earned money? So Meredith says that it was below the belt just because Angie K got champagne poured on her. That was really mean of her to say that. So now Angie K is like, really Meredith, you too? Now, what if I pour champagne on your head? Would you go for that? Like, I don't understand. You're minimizing my feelings and supporting her. And I was surprised at Meredith saying that it's below the belt because Meredith, we could say that what you said about Lisa and retaliation was below the belt, bringing up the SEC filings and whatnot. I mean, I was really surprised to hear that. And we know that you and Jen have had your issues in the first two seasons. It's just really crazy to see this 180 that you've done. Like, you're now her biggest supporter. And I'm like, girl, what? I mean, I understand that you like Jen now, but you can also acknowledge when she's wrong. And her pouring that drink on Angie K's head was wrong. You would be pissed if anybody on this cast did that to you. And you know it. So here goes Angie K telling her sob story about she had been dealing with all this abuse from Jen for the past few months prior to filming. Jen was texting her, cursing her out. And I said, now wait, because there is no way that a friend is cursing me out and getting away with it. That's not happening. And on top of that, if she was treating you so badly, then why did you go ahead and host Coach Shaw's birthday party at your home? It's giving desperation 
that you wanted to be on this show by any means, that you would put up with piss poor treatment for months just to be on this show. So now you have Angie K giving some real tired read saying, Meredith, you need to go back to a cubicle because you have poor social skills. Baby, when I tell you that Meredith Marks clear, she said, actually, I have excellent people skills, okay? My jewelry line is thriving. And on top of that, I'm not the one who has been trying to be on this show for three years. That's you. I said, cleared. And Angie K was so shook. She's talking about, do you know who I am? I'm from SLC. And I was like, okay, and your point? You're from Salt Lake City, but yet and still, Bravo was not checking for you. You had to beg to be on this show and take poor treatment from Jen Shah to get on. Meredith let her know, like, I'm that girl. You're not. Remember that. <laughs> so now Andy addresses why did Angie K feel the need to run her mouth to Lisa about what Meredith, Heather, and Jen were saying about the SEC filings about Vita Tequila. So here goes Angie saying that she was triggered because two days before, Jen was talking about Heather like a dog, about Heather's business. Heather was so over it, she said, okay, girl, first of all, my business stands by itself, okay? Like, Beauty Lab is thriving. I don't care what Jen said. And Angie K going on that long diatribe about why she went back and told Lisa because she's a businesswoman herself and she's worked her ass off and she would not like for anybody to do that to her. It's like, okay, like, just be honest, Angie. You ran back and told Lisa because you wanted to be messy and you wanted some screen time. That's it and that's all. And now Lisa interjects because God forbid the conversation was not about her. She wanted to make it about her. So she's like, I have never been a part of any scheme with Jen Shah. And I feel like every time Jen talks badly about somebody's business, it's not right. And I think it's very wrong. And I said, well, thank you for that PSA, Lisa and thank you for your services. Now this final segment with Heather and the black eye, I'm not even going to bore you guys with the details. Heather, you made absolutely no sense and you pulled all this out of your ass. I said, girl, are you serious? For you to waste everybody's time like this, you had all of us thinking all along that somebody assaulted you for us to finally find out that you got blackout drunk and you don't even know what happened to you. I said, you know what? If Heather doesn't come back on for season four, I'll be okay with that. I was too through. This was a waste of time. And it's clear that Heather wanted attention and she did this for a storyline since hers was not existent. Because I can tell you right now, I did not care at all about that choir storyline or this book storyline. Boring. But Andy points out that Heather told several different stories. She said that she remembered what happened. Then she said that she didn't know what happened. Then she said that all the ladies knew what happened. And he wants to know what happened. Like I said, Heather reveals that she has no idea what happened. All she knows is that she got blackout drunk. So now Lisa interjects and she says, but Heather, I wish that you had just said that from get-go because Bravo launched an investigation and that could have had major implications on us and production. So Andy reveals that Lisa's right. There was an investigation that was done, but nothing was found. And on top of that, there's no other footage. So Heather says that when she woke up the next morning, she was terrified. And Andy's like, why were you terrified? So now Heather says, well, I was terrified that they would spin the narrative. And I wanted to know, who's they? And even Andy was like, um, Heather, who's they? And she says, my castmates, I was afraid that they would spin a narrative and make me look bad. And I'm thinking, Heather, that makes no sense. All you had to do was open your mouth and say, guys, I got blackout drunk. I fell. I tripped. I have no idea how this happened. And that would have been that. But for you to sit there for four episodes and act like, well, maybe somebody hit me. I mean, I don't want to say what happened. I know what happened. 
but I'ma wait for the other ladies to tell me what they know. You made it into this whole mystery of who hit Heather. And now you're sitting here at this reunion sounding stupid, talking about, well, I got blackout drunk and I was too embarrassed to say that. You wasted our time for four whole episodes with this crap. And Heather, I had no sympathy for you when you started crying, talking about, I was embarrassed to admit that I got blackout drunk because I still have a lot of Mormon shame about drinking, especially on national television. And I said, we're not gonna do this. We are not gonna do this today. I am so sick and tired of Heather pulling out that Mormon sob story every time. I'm sick of it. One minute you want to be a rebel and a badass, I don't care, F the church. Now it's, well, I'm afraid of what the church thinks. Like, you can't have it both ways. You wasted everybody's time. And even though Lisa gets on my last nerve, she told no lies when she checked Heather. And she said, Heather, the implications of this could have led to people losing their jobs. And even Andy co-signed on it. He was like, well, Heather, this makes no sense because you do realize that plenty of housewives on other franchises have gotten blackout drunk. Have you seen Luann Deliceps on New York, Sonia Morgan, Ramona? Those ladies get drunk. The ladies on OC, Beverly Hills, everybody on these shows gets shit-faced when they're on vacation. It's not a new thing. People get drunk who aren't on TV. Like, I mean, come on. I think that everybody who drinks has been there. I mean, I know I've had a few of those nights, but the point is for you to use it as a crutch. Well, I was embarrassed about being drunk. Like, Heather, this makes no sense. You sound crazy. And God forbid somebody had gotten fired because they assumed that it was somebody who hit you and nothing of the sort happened. And Andy even said, you made it seem like somebody assaulted you. And the way Heather kept contradicting herself throughout this segment, because she said in the beginning, oh, I didn't even want them to launch an investigation. And then she says, yeah, I was happy that Bravo did launch one. And they're all like, which one is it, sis? So now Andy wants to know, why was Jen the first person that Heather called in the morning? So Heather says that she trusts Jen the most and that Jen has the best cover stories. I said, okay, Heather. And once again, why do you need to have a cover story in the first place? Whitney and Angie K both say that they thought that Jen did have something to do with her eye. Whitney says the way Heather set it up, it definitely seemed like she was covering for Jen. So now Andy wants to know, did Heather at least ask Jen if Jen was the one who hit her? And Heather says that they joked around about it and that was it. And then Heather says that she would rather Jen hit her than a stranger. And they're all like, what? I just said, what is going on? Heather, you sounded like an idiot. I'm sorry. I, I, I just lost so much respect for you during this segment. Because again, you were talking out two sides of your face. I mean, you did not make any sense. And I really feel like the embarrassment hits you in the moment. Like, damn, I let all the viewers down. Because here I am pretending like somebody hit me. And the whole time, I just got drunk. And I'm trying to pretend like it was worse than what it was. Then Andy brings up the theory going around that Heather was covering up for Jen because of Jen's trial and how it could implicate her even more. So Heather does admit that if Jen had hit her, she would have covered for Jen. By this point, I just tuned Heather out. I was so over it. Heather caused all this confusion for nothing. If there is a season four, Bravo needs to dock your pay or demote you to a friend of. Because the fact that you could have really gotten somebody fired, you really had people worried that somebody assaulted you and you went along with it. And while I've gotten on Andy, many times about not pressing the women. I was happy that he pressed Heather on the fact that all she had to do was clear this up by just saying that she had blacked out in the first place. He didn't let that go. I was pleasantly surprised. Now we end this first part with all the women giving their theories about what they thought happened. Whitney says that she thought that Jen did hit her. Then Angie K gives her two theories. 
about how she feels like Heather either tripped or fell or she thinks that Jen did it because Jen was a bit subdued the next day and she felt like it was a sign of guilt. And then she adds that at their last dinner in San Diego, when the producer asked Heather at the table, well, what happened to your eye? She says that Jen turned to Heather and said, well, what are you gonna tell them? And Angie K said that it just felt really weird, like it was a setup and it felt very dark. Then Dana gives her theory that maybe they both got drunk and some elbows got thrown around and that's how Heather got the black eye. And now we have Andy bringing up Angie K's allegations about Jen and Heather possibly having sex and that's where the black eye came from. So now you have Angie K saying that she's heard some rumors that Jen and Heather have had a sexual relationship and Heather's like, girl, stop. And that's where the episode ends. This first part, like I said in the beginning, it was okay. I stand by what I've been saying that this should have been a one part 90 minute reunion and that should have been it. The fact that they're giving us multiple parts when nothing happened and the biggest storyline of them all regarding Heather's eye was a sham, it really should have been one part. I'm going to be honest, guys. I don't know if I'm going to review the last two parts. I'm just not interested anymore. I've checked out. If I do recap them, I will probably do a combined recap of two and three. I'm just really over SLC. If there is a season four, we need a shakeup in the cast. We need some new faces. Bring Mary back because this dynamic is not giving what the other girl said it was supposed to have gave. Both of the Angies aren't doing it for me. I don't care too much for Dana. I think she's kind of boring. Like, we need Mary Cosby back especially with Jen Shah on her way to prison. But y'all, those are my thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching my recap. I hope you all enjoyed and you already know what to do. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and I will see you all later. Bye.